One of the things that looked interesting to me in the numbers, the data, uh, about uh, who, is, who is using broadband and who isn't, is that English-speaking Hispanics seem to be using broadband at about the same rate as whites. 42% for whites and one category 40% for Hispanics, or 48 and 46, I think those um, have more specific numbers here. But while African Americans are still lagging pretty severely behind them. Um, what do you think is the reason is the reason for that disparity in particular and the disparity between that and other communities of color and, and the disabled? So I you know I, I've been looking at this this issue for a little while now um, being an, an entrepreneur being in love with the internet and being an african-american um, and, and I think there's there's three reasons that I think the disparity is there first and foremost I think we have a value proposition problem in the inner cities when it comes to the internet and technology um, I think a lot of um, people in those sectors don't see the value in the internet they see it as something that's too costly um, and, and I like to tell people for example that the opportunities in the internet are immense for example if you go into any city and say, hey, I know somebody who um, three years ago was eating college dorm lunches and within five years is worth more money than Puffy, Jay-Z, and Russell Simmons put together, I think you get everybody's attention. And I said, oh, he built whatever he built, he built it for free using free tools. And that's Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. And I say the last point, the difference is between those other three guys and him, your parents are using his product too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think... Um, that first issue was a value proposition issue. We need to figure out a way to show um, people of color and people in urban centers the value and the opportunities on the internet. The second one is cost. I think a lot of times when you talk to people about buying a computer, they say it's a huge cost structure, but at the same time, they'll probably most likely have an Xbox, a PlayStation, or a Wii in their home, and that's really about a perception, is that they don't understand the cost structures have changed. And then lastly, that the internet as a whole is intangible, right? People don't really go out. You don't have people go out and say, hey, I heard you just got two T1s. Can I come over and see what they look like in your house? <laughs> you know, but the difference between that and, say, mobile devices, you can touch it, you can feel it, you have a connection to it. So a lot of people in those areas don't see the connection. And usually when they get internet, it's bundled in with other services. A related point to this. We also see in some of the background research that there is a great use of uh, PDAs and mobile technology among minority communities. So my question to the panel is, by focusing on broadband, are we, are we ourselves limiting our, what needs to be done in terms of, what need, of, in terms of access by m minority communities, or is PDA, mobile, wireless technology, is that not enough? They need something more than that. Well, I think first and foremost, <clears throat> we need to make the caveat that nowadays a lot of the wireless is broadband on some of the 3G networks. So we're really talking about the difference between wireline into the home and wireless. And to go back to your earlier point, I think the real reason is, A, what I mentioned before, that it's tangible. But B, if you look at kind of the, the product and uh, device subsidies that happen in the mobile space that don't happen in wireline, that's eased adoption as well. And also when you talk about lower income in inner cities, the credit limitations that, the, that you know, some of the providers put on the beginning aren't there anymore. You have products like Boost Mobile and things of that nature that basically anyone who wants a cell phone or wants a PDA can get one. And I don't think we have that on the wireline side. You know, just recently you've started to see providers package computers into their services, but it's really packaged into kind of the three-prong approach. I think what we need to see more of is that same kind of subsidy, but just focused on the internet and, and the device itself. So how do we pay for all this? We want to do all these upgrades. We heard some discussion in the uh, keynote speech about taxes uh, and the resistance to taxes. But what in the private sector will get people to focus on improving access for these communities? Well, well I think um, first and foremost, I think there's some, there's some type of misconception that a lot of these things cost a lot of money to do, right? The beauty of the internet right now, specifically being an entrepreneur, is that the cost of barrier of entry is so low. And I always tell people, I challenge you to tell me an idea you want to do, and let me see if you can do it for less than $100. And I'll give you a great example. Um, you know, I started writing a, a blog recently in avowalright.com about creating the next generation of entrepreneurs to talk about this. So I looked at the iPhone, for example, and I said, you know what, I'm going to go down the path of what it would take to learn and figure out how to build an iPhone app. So I went to my local library. I found a free iPhone book at the library. Um, I went to iTunes and found a class that's being taught at Stanford on iPhone development that's available free through iTunes. 
and then I went and looked at how much it costs to get my app onto the App Store and it's $99, right? So if you take that in contrast to opening a restaurant, opening a laundromat, or any of the other, you know, any of the other businesses out there, the, the barrier to entry is, 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 is there is none. Let's just say there is none, right? But that isn't communicated. So I think first and foremost, we need to educate people on the things that are available today. I mean, I even changed the, 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 uh, the title of this panel from future benefits to benefits today because the speed of the internet, if you start talking about the future, um, by the time we get to that stuff, it's going to change anyway. So <laughs> we need to talk about today. And in terms of the cost, I think, um, you know, there's, it's a crucial time right now. And I think, um, you know, no one's brought up the elephant in the room about the whole net neutrality regulations and things that are going on there. And I think, you know, I can honestly say I just figured out net neutrality yesterday at about 3.30, right? <laughs> uh, exactly to the nose. I looked at the watch. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the problem is, is there's a misperception of um, access in the Internet today because we all look at the internet as this free and tangible thing that kind of comes with our, our telephone and our, tel and our TV service and we don't directly pay for it and the challenge is we've been consuming it so much over the last five or six years that you know the conversations that are happening now at the consumer level have happened for decades at the corporate IT level where you know we, you build a website you you get traffic to it you have to pay for more bandwidth to get it to there but the challenge is that's, that model has flipped, and now we have to explain that to consumers. The problem is that those consumers are just starting to figure out the Internet in general to begin with, and now you have to have secondary conversations, which goes all the way back to the whole thing about value proposition. So to get people to pay for it, you have to give them the value proposition because if you show them that you can watch all your TV shows, that you can get access to medical information, that you can essentially teach yourself skills. I mean, I was at a conference the other day, and someone from the Knight Foundation said that places like Walmart and Target are putting all their, their job applications online. Now, that's great, but if I'm someone in the inner city that doesn't have internet and doesn't have a car and can only afford to go to that store once in the hopes of filling out an application for a job and I get there and they say, hey, you can just fill out online, it's no problem, it's a lot easier now, I'm done, right? So those kind of realities that kind of come, come out. And I think once we do that, you'll have the people in those areas pushing so hard for those things that cost won't be an issue. And then lastly, because I know I've been talking for a minute, that, you know, when you talk about unemployment rates and opportunities and, and things that are happening in a recession, I believe that there's so many untapped ideas and, and business opportunities that they will pay for themselves. We just have to educate people on what the tools are and give them access to.